from NICU babies to ER to labor and delivery rooms and even to pediatrics, heart failure is everywhere. It is probably the one condition that you are guaranteed to see. For each of these populations, the care will be very similar, so it would be worth your time to follow along closely. For the purpose though of this course, I will only speak of health failure in the older adult. So, in the beginning, heart failure doesn't look like much on the outside. In fact, you may not even think heart failure, especially if you look at the common causes and risk factors for heart failure. Hint, hint, it is in the table in your, um, in your book there. But just like a car, all things are connected to the engine in some shape or form. And performance is definitely going to be effective if, say, one part goes bad here or there. The name heart failure implies exactly what is going on with the heart. The cardiac output is insufficient and can't meet the demands of the body. The body, though, is amazing in that it has tons of built-in mechanisms that try to help the body sustain itself. While this is helpful in the short term, we are going to have some major long-term problems that keep compounding if we don't intervene with diet modifications, medications, and other non-pharmacological interventions. Now students, before we go anywhere in this conversation, can we please pull over and talk about the why and the how of heart failure? Okay, you say, Ms. Tonis, why and how does the heart fail? Well. I'm going to respond, which heart? And you're going to say, the only one? Ah, yes, student. But it is very helpful to think of these things as two independent organs. It's like telling the mechanic the engine broke. Well, which part? Let's dive into the why and the how of left-sided heart failure first. It's the main one and the most common one. The main cause of left-sided heart failure is systemic hypertension. And you know how many people have hypertension, AKA the silent killer. How about a lot? Some other causes are coronary, artery disease, and valvular disease. Well, how do you get those conditions? Uh, well, not exactly a topic for today, but the short answer is something like poor diet, high cholesterol, no exercise, obesity, smoking, heavy drinking, drug use, and the usual. Right. These patients are setting themselves up for a nicely large left-sided MI. Unfortunately, about a third of patients experiencing MI develop permanent heart failure. Super sad. That's some really bad odds. <clears throat> All right, right-sided heart failure <clears throat> without the presence of left-sided heart failure, <clears throat> excuse me, is usually related to COPD or pulmonary hypertension. Some other causes of right-sided heart failure include left ventricular failure. Wait, you mean to tell me to think independent, but now I need to remember that the left side can cause the right? Yep, I didn't say that they weren't connected, did I? I just said think of them independently. So to repeat myself, a cause of right-sided heart failure is long-standing left-sided heart failure. You can also have a right ventricular MI or myocardium infarction. It is more rare kind of MI, but it does happen. Uh, and then when, someone hearts, when someone's heart fails, there will be times of health and being symptom free, and then there will be times of exacerbation. The exacerbation times can range from uh, mild to severe and chronic to complete acute. Future nurses, pay attention. What this means is while my patient just got admitted for appendicitis and I see there's a medical history of heart failure, I am going to pause really, really long before I do things that might exacerbate a heart failure, such as administer IV fluids, administer NSAIDs, which make you retain water, and something like um, thiazo Oh, this heart is, word is so hard. Thiazolidodones. The lido, yeah, we're going to go with that. 
these medications uh, can collectively cause fluid retention and that medication that I mentioned by the way I'll describe it later these medications collectively may cause fluid retention and a weak heart although asymptomatic now while they're in the hospital for appendicitis could very well get thrown into exacerbation and I if I were you I would double check with a doc about this combination of drugs and FYI so that drug I mentioned that drug class I mentioned earlier diazolidine dione's that's it diazolidine dione's <laughs> those are actually a, tr a group of drugs used for diabetic patients we are going to be learning about one of the prototype ones pioglitazone also known as actos when we learn about diabetes anyway all right last but not least is high output failure I think I clicked a little too soon. Last but not least is high output failure. And on the last slide, that's that whole heart sweating and having his little tongue panting. This means the whole heart has failed. The whole chalupa. Wait, the whole taco. No, the whole quesadilla. No, I mean the whole enchilada. The whole heart will fail. And high output heart failure is caused by septicemia. That's where you have an overwhelming infection in your bloodstream anemia or hyperthyroidism a high metabolic situation such as hyperthyroidism so the pictures on the previous slide i really want you to associate each of those heart failures with the images the lungs represent the left-sided heart failure the body should represent the right side heart failure and that heart is um, an example of high output failure because it's the whole heart all right, let's go on learning about them onward. Now to my current picture here of the broken down Mustang, <clears throat> which I hope that's a Mustang. It looks like a Mustang. Well, when our engine gives out and things begin to break and we will slowly but surely show signs on the outside that we have an internal problem. When we have left-sided heart failure, we are going to see two things. First thing is the effect of the blood not getting effectively ejected from the heart to the rest of the body. So there is going to be weakness, activity intolerance, easy fatigue, uh, dizziness, and oliguria during the daytime because the kidneys are not being perfused well by the bad heart. So they're not going to make as much urine. Then when a person sits and rest, that person will um, say take a nap or sleep the heart can actually pump a bit more effectively against gravity and, and um, then if it was pumping against gravity and movement, excuse me, and the patient will urinate a lot at night. So a person with left-sided heart failure will have nocturia. Um, speaking of laying down, we should also ask a person, how do they sleep at night? How do they sleep at night? I can almost guarantee you that they are not ever, ever, ever going to tell you that they sleep flat. They usually sleep in a recliner or maybe in a bed with like five or so pillows to prop them up. This is called orthopnea. Orthopnea. I want you to take your left-sided heart failure patient's pulse and you may notice that there is um, it is beating a bit faster than normal, so they'll have tachycardia, and it may even change moment to moment in strength. It may change moment to moment in strength. Like one second is regular and um, strong, two plus, and then the next three beats, it's like weak and thready, like a one plus. This is called pulses alternans, pulses alternans. The heart rate is going to be irregular too. In fact, it's very common for people with heart failure to have irregular and abnormal heart rhythms. Hmm, so I already have a weak heart and now I throw in an irregular asynchronous beat. Well, how do you think their cardiac output is now? That engine is not only running on three cylinders, but now it's misfiring. Like a good nurse, you're going to know how to check one of the first signs of heart failure or decreased ventricular compliance, right? You're going to go and take your bell of your stethoscope and you're going to place it on the patient's apex of the heart. That is the fourth intercostal space mid clavicular line. 
you are going to listen for that first indicator of heart failure, which is an S3 sound, S3 sound. I've actually put a YouTube video clip in your cardiovascular module so you can hear what it sounds like. In my personal opinion, it sounds nothing like Kentucky, but that's just me. Now, our person may begin to experience chest pains, palpitations, uh, especially if perfusion to the heart is too low. All right, now for the second thing that we are going to see in our patient with left-sided heart failure. Remember those lungs? Yep. That's what I want you to remember. They are going to have pulmonary congestion signs and symptoms. This occurs as hydrostatic pressure isn't high enough for the cells and fluid to keep, you know, moving on through. Thus, it begins to leak into the alveoli. Leaky, leaky, no likey, likey. Mm. Oftentimes, it will start as a dry cough that your patient has, maybe a wheeze, maybe some shortness of breath with activity, aka exertional dyspnea. Well, uh, then your person may even have PND, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. What is that? Well, this is uh, a nice, there is a nice description in your book. Please go check it out. Um, let's keep moving on. So going on with the wheeze and the cough and the shortness of breath activity. Then your person will actually begin having tachypnea, meaning fast breathing, at rest and then that dry cough becomes a wet one over time and then oh you say well let's listen to the lungs and you will find that the there is wheezing plus crackles mmm better note the location of those crackles because you will need something to compare it to if your patient heart uh, fails even more so and you might be able to actually catch their decline faster just by noting the location of the crackles and if it's you know increasing or uh, you know remaining stable well in our story here no one is actually ca catching the patient's uh, decline in status and the crackles are becoming more present and diffuse throughout the lung fields and now your patient is not only coughing but they are coughing and producing frothy sputum yes I said frothy sounds like I have a lisp frothy uh, warning, don't dismiss this frothy sputum as spit. It is not spit. The coughing, hacking uh, is super insufficient and now the body is really trying hard by moving all the fluid up from the poor drowning alveoli and as it comes up, it's coming up all bubbled and frothy for you. And just before the lungs totally get overwhelmed, that frothy sputum is now gonna turn pink tinged and that's considered really bad uh, and your person is most likely becoming hypoxic and that's evidenced by their restlessness and confusion these my dear students are your oh crap filings findings pink frothy sputum restlessness confusion all of those are very late signs and symptoms of pulmonary edema and you have just moments to rescue your patient from a code situation. Well, what am I gonna do, Ms. Tonis? Well, you're going to continue listening to this PowerPoint and I'm gonna tell you what to do. Next. Well, I'm actually not ready yet to tell you how we're going to save that one patient. So for now, you're gonna have to hold it. Funny, I told my kids the same thing on the drive home today. She's gonna have to hold it, okay? Anyway. All right, right side. Let's go with our patient um, that had long-standing COPD and they developed that core pulmonale or right-sided heart failure. <clears throat> now, blood doesn't just zip into the lungs anymore and since it's gotta go somewhere, it tends to back up and congest in our peripheral circulation. Well, where is that exactly? Well, it's maybe where your veins are. Let's start with the peripheral veins like in the arms and the legs. Vessels in, at the capillary level are not some kind of sealed off closed ended pipes. They actually have teeny tiny itty bitty little holes in the membranes where fluids and waste and oxygen are exchanged between the tissues and the blood. Now when fluids and cellular waste are moving like they should, um, you know, up through the heart because the heart is bad, those teeny tiny little holes will get backwashed of fluid into the tissues. 
Now I'm using my words loosely and more figuratively because technically nothing is being washed, okay? But just go with the fact that fluid is going to begin to uh, accumulate in any dependent area of the body. Now, you and I both know patients aren't going to wake up and uh, or walk up to you and say, I have peripheral edema in my dependent areas. Yeah, that the chances of that happening are like never. What you're going to hear are my legs are super heavy feeling, or I have rings on my ankles from my socks, or my shoes are too tight, especially at the end of the day. Maybe my rings on my hands won't fit. It is then up to you and your two hands to push into their shins, the back of their angles, ankles, uh, elbows, forearms, and sacrum area to test for edema. Now, it will be bilateral edema in all extremities, unless a patient has one or leg or something like that propped up, you know, that's kind of a rare situation. But anticipate edema everywhere. Next thing I want you to do is to look and see if they have big jugs or not. Oh, Jesus, help us. I am not talking about their, you know, other kind of jugs. I'm talking about jugular veins. You went there first. Remember, not me. Let's look more central now and see what veins we have. Um, see what veins where we are possibly going to get congestion. Ah, the liver, the liver and the spleen, they both have lots of veins. With the hepatic engorgement that comes from right-sided heart failure, your person is then going to complain of nausea, anorexia, aka poor appetite, and if the heart failure is really advanced and putting a lot of pressure on the hepatic circulatory system, then expect ascites. Ascites, that's fluid in the abdomen. The kidneys may be making urine like normal in the daytime, but at night when the person lays down, the fluid will shift back into the circulatory system and polyuria occurs. Polyuria, so basically both sides of the heart leads the patient peeing at night. Hey, who knows the most reliable indicator of fluid gain or loss? Anybody? Did you say accurate eyes and nose? Uh, nope, I hope you didn't. Did you say measuring someone's waist circumference in centimeters? Nope, hope you didn't say that either. Oh, wait, maybe you said x-ray uh, of the chest measuring the fluid presence or absence in the lungs. Nope, wrong again. The most reliable indicator of a person's fluid or loss, uh, gain or loss, is taking someone's weight. Get this. Tissue has a tremendous amount of expansion power and can really support extra space for fluids. I'm not saying this is a good thing. What I'm saying is weight gain is going to happen and it's going to happen probably slowly. So much so that unless someone is weighing themselves every day, it's actually going to go unnoticed until edema actually starts showing up. And at that point, the heart is really on its last leg and you might be on the verge of having a heart failure exacerbation. Take a look at this picture. Think to yourself, what kind of heart failure is this patient in? Got your answer? left side. Uh, that whole, oh, my chest hurts, that is signs and symptoms of maybe an irregular pulse, maybe some chest pains and palpitations that the person may have. These are common in left-sided heart failure, and they also have lots of ectopic beats. I didn't draw this, by the way. My student did. I liked it. That's why I'm using it. All right, what kind of heart failure is this patient in? I know, right? The patient actually has polyuria, um, especially during the night hand time, uh, the night time, distended jugs. Yes, we do say that in the hospital. They got big jugs. <laughs> oh, geez. Okay. Let's check out some lab work. So after looking at our patient, we have determined that they have some very suspicious symptoms for heart failure. Well, let's go to the labs. Let's go to the data. If we look at their electrolytes, we are going to see that their sodium 
and their chloride are going to be low. I've actually put a reference table here for you to uh, double check and memorize. Please mem begin memorizing these values here. So we are going to see hyponatremia and hyperchloremia. Their kidney function, specifically their BUN and creatinine, they are going to be high. They're going to be elevated. So a female may have a creatinine of like 1.8 and a BUN of like 30. A patient will have a low H and H. So if we're talking about a male, their hemoglobin is probably going to be like 12 and their hematocrit in the 30s. <clears throat> BNP, also known as BTNP, stands for B-type natriuretic peptide. This is a naturally occurring peptide that gets produced by the cardiac ventricles. However, there is a huge correlation of a rising BTNP, and it equals the stress on the heart. So if I see a rising BTNP or BNP, that means there is a big stress on the heart. Thus, a lot of this peptide is getting released. So oftentimes we will do serial BTNPs on our heart failure patient, maybe like one every day or every couple of days. How about a urinalysis? We can grab urine, believe it or not. And what we are looking for is microalbuminuria microalbuminuria. This is actually an early indicator of decreased compliance of the heart and it occurs before the B and P even rises. Love it! This is an early warning and detector um, of heart failure. Okay, early warning detector of heart failure. We actually will ask patients to grab, uh, to leave a urine sample uh, once a year, uh, usually in the outpatient setting, and we're testing it for microalbuminuria microalbumin plus urea. Don't know why I can't make my tongue say it. ABGs, we're going to grab some blood gases because we are going to be suspicious for respiratory acidosis. Respiratory acidosis. Okay, what imaging can we do on our patient? Well, one of the best diagnostic tools is, drumroll pre, please, a echocardiogram. Yes, siree, echocardiogram. This is going to let us know the function of the heart and <clears throat> some particular numbers that we're looking for on the echocardiogram is the ejection fraction. It's called the ejection fraction. Sometimes in the hospital, you'll hear them say, what is the EF? I don't know why, I guess we get too lazy to say ejection fraction. And what this means is the ejection fraction is the percent of blood ejected from the left ventricle, ventricle at a given heartbeat. And then if it is less than expected, that means we are looking at some bad heart failure. Normal EF is about 50 to 70 percent. Normal EF is about 50 to 70 percent. Um, we start experiencing signs and symptoms of heart failure when your EF is about 40 and below. When it's about 40 and below. I had this one patient, his EF was 18. He couldn't even cut his chicken. He had chicken on his tray and just the whole using his hands to hold the fork and to saw the chicken back and forth. He got so winded, uh, I ended up having to basically feed him um, you know, with, yeah, I basically had to feed him because he wasn't even able to feed himself and to pray, prepare his food for himself. It was pretty sad. His EF was like 18. Not good. All right, chest X-ray. What are we looking for on a chest X-ray? We are going to be looking for maybe some pulmonary edema that will show up. It may say that there is some infiltrates, um, may see some consolidation. You may see those words there. Also on the chest X-ray, I look for on the impression words that say enlarged cardiac silhouette, enlarged cardiac silhouette. They also, that lets us know too that our patient has a big heart. Moving forward, let's do an EKG on our patient because we know that they are prone to 
arrhythmias and it's very important to know if they do have an arrhythmia that we may can give them appropriate medications to suppress that because arrhythmias plus uh, weak heart equals really bad cardiac output. Remember our engine, three cylinders and it misfires, just it's not going to go well. Not going to go well. All right. Last but not least is a pulmonary arterial uh, artery catheter. Now, this really is not something you're going to see on the floor. Um, this is known, um, another name for this is a Swan's Gans catheter. And it's crazy to me that we can do this, but see all these tubes and everything? We will insert this into somebody's jugular vein. It will go down their superior vena cava in their right atrium, right ventricle, way up into a pulmonary artery. And it's going to sit right here. And at a certain time, the nurse is going to inflate a balloon. They are going to read some numbers on a monitor. And can you believe this? But it's actually going to measure the pressure that is inside this left ventricle, the pressure and the ability of this uh, to pump to the rest of the body. And it's measuring it at the capillary bed level. I just, that just blows my mind that we actually figured that out. Mr. Dr. Swans Gans is a very, very smart man. He's on his yacht right now enjoying life. Okay, so um, what do I need you to know? That this is the most invasive way to measure somebody's left ventricle function. Most invasive way. And that type of pressure is called getting a wedge pressure. So if a doctor ever asks you for a wedge pressure, you are probably an ICU nurse or a CRNA dealing with a very sick patient. All right, so what are our nursing priorities? Our nursing priorities include, number one, impaired gas exchange. That's our nursing diagnosis. Impaired gas exchange. The next one is decreased cardiac output. The one after that is fatigue and weakness. Last but not least, potential full for pulmonary edema. So all of our interventions are going to center around those four things. Impaired gas exchange, decreased cardiac compliance, fatigue and weakness, and the potential for uh, pulmonary edema. Next. Okay, so the first one is promoting gas exchange and oxygen exchange. We are probably going to do different levels of oxygen or provide our patient different liters of oxygen and any other kind of ventilation assistance, such as this BiPAP here. That is what is on this person's face. That is BiPAP. How do you think a claustrophobic patient likes this? Answer is they don't at all. So oftentimes you will be going in this patient's room often to remind them to put their mask back on, but I'm not gonna say what's nice. Mm, no, oftentimes patients are so weak <laughs> they're not able to pull this mask off because that thing is strapped on good. But anyway, we might have to give them ventilation assistance. You are going to monitor their rate, their rhythm, um, and the like depth every one to four hours. You are going to auscultate their breath sounds about the same frequency uh, at least every four hours. Make sure those crackles are not expanding to different lung fields because that means our person's heart is getting worse. We're going to sit our patient in um, mid to high Fowler's, which is like 60 to 90 degrees. If they are dyspneic, you may want to keep them up there. Make sure their arms are propped up on pillows. That always helps. I don't have a picture of that, but that always helps to get them more oxygen. Reposition them every two hours. They are going to be so weak, they cannot do it themselves. So you are going to be there to assist them and not get breakdown. Make sure, make sure that you encourage them to do deep breathing exercises every two hours. They are very high risk for getting pneumonia. Uh, because of the possible fluid accumulation. You are, your goal for their oxygen sat is about 90% or above. Do make sure to collaborate with your respiratory therapist because they are very, very uh, skilled professionals in how to some, improve somebody's oxygenation. 
So just like percussion. One of our next priorities that we need to uh, implement for our patient who has heart failure is to improve the cardiac output. Now, if we are going to improve the cardiac output, we should focus on information all contained within the slide. It's a lot. First things first is our non-pharmacologic interventions. First one I'm thinking of is nutrition therapy. And in nutrition therapy, we're going to look at somebody's fluid intake. We need to reduce their fluid intake to about two liters per day. How much is two liters? 2,000 milliliters? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, because patients don't oftentimes understand liters and metric uh, measurements, tell them about half a gallon. About half a gallon equals two liters. Now, what counts as liquid? Does jello count? Yes. Ice cream? Yes. Oatmeal? No. Popsicle? Yes. <coughs> Make sure your patient omits table salt. They need to omit table salt. In fact, uh, it would not be a bad idea for them to get a little app that helps calculate their <coughs> salt intake per day. We're looking at three grams. Why is that like an old lady? <clears throat> All right, they need to take in about three grams of salt per day. And uh, I don't know about you, but if you've actually ever counted how much sodium you take per day, it's probably close to like <laughs> six, five or six. It's a lot. It's five or six grams per day. Now, we are going to further limit them to two grams if someone has a really weak heart or has uncontrolled hypertension. It is not beneficial to limit so more, uh, like less sodium than that. So not like 1.5 or anything. Two is kind of your limit, two to three grams per day. They will definitely need to choose lower salty foods, such as processed meats, things like that. Uh, monitor their fluids and record amounts. So can a tech, a patient care tech, measure and record eyes and nose? Answer is in most places, yes, actually. Another, why am I getting this wheel here? Okay, another non-pharmacologic intervention is dope, daily weights. Now remember this, one kilogram of weight equals one liter of fluid. And an adult may retain four to seven liters of fluid before pitting edema even occurs. Ooh, 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 math time, math time. Okay, so if a person's body and tissues can hide four to seven liters of fluid, then how much weight and pounds had they gained before developing pitting edema? And remember, one kilogram of weight equals one, lead, one liter of water. They can hide four to seven liters. What is that in pounds? Pause if you like really need to do math. Okay, you ready for the answer? Did you get 8.8 .8 to 15.4 pounds? <laughs> right, that is crazy. <clears throat> I would like to explain that my recent weight gain of 10 pounds is because I actually have 4.5 liters of water congested in my vascular system. <laughs> okay, back to the lecture. Is pitting edema an early or a late sign of heart failure? Knowing all this, you better have said late. So tell your patients how important it is that daily weights are done. And if the patient begins gaining weight, then they are to call the doctor and we usually give them an extra dose or two of a diuretic, maybe eh, for like five days or so. And then when their weight gets back to normal, they go back to their normal med um, regimen. Ah, uh, yes, I just mentioned it. Doo -doo. Diuretics. These are the first line of drugs for our heart failure patients. Mm -hmm. They excrete sodium and water, so it's a win-win situation. The type of diuretic that a person with heart failure gets mm, kind of really depends upon their heart failure severity. But thiazide diuretics, especially, um, or specifically I should say, hydrochlorothiazide, are actually preferred related to the gradual onset of diuresis and there is a decreased risk of dehydration as compared to say like loop diuretics. Can you give me an example of a loop diuretic? Hmm, spironolactone. 
Nope. How about furosemide? Yep. When people are on diuretics, please monitor their blood pressure prior to administration because if it's low, it's a no-go. If the blood pressure is low, diuretics are a no-go. Got it? Now, I also need you to assess the I's and O's, the intakes and the outputs. Now, students, <clears throat> listen up. In clinical, when I ask students what to assess when our heart failure patients on a diuretic and they say verbatim what you just said there, well, we're going to assess the I's and O's, um, I'll respond, okay, well, what you looking for? Who cares what they are? I mean, what do those numbers mean to us and our diuretic that we are about to give and shove into our patient's hands? I mean, what is the relationship? Okay, so there's typically a long pause, much like the one you are having right now. Well, why do I check the eyes and nose and what do those numbers really mean? Mm, I usually guide the students back to their Davis drug guide to look specifically over um, areas of medication contraindications, adverse reactions, and side effects. So I'm gonna actually put this one on you. Go ahead now and Take a look at hydrochlorothiazide, look at the contraindications, adverse reactions to the side effects, and you tell me why are, why are we monitoring somebody's eyes and nose for a patient? So I hope you can go get that answer. Okay, back to nursing interventions. You're going to assess for daily weight if they're on diuretics to see if it is stable or dropping, which is good. I want to see weight go down or stay the same, especially if they've got all the fluid off. Uh, we're going to check their feet, their legs, and their sacral area. Uh, that should be, um, you know, having little to no edema there. And how can I tell if the edema is going down? Well, please check out this picture because edema usually makes the skin kind of tight and shiny like that. I don't know. Can you get, are you looking at it? Yeah, I should be looking at it. It's very tight and very shiny. Now, Obviously, you are going to push on the patient and you are going to notice and grade their pitting edema. But I don't know, can you see this little section of skin like right here? Oh, that's really bad. Yeah, I'm on a mouse here, y'all. Give some, give some grace. But you see that section there? Imagine that wrinkled, crepe looking skin everywhere on their legs. It's kind of like uh, wadded up sheets. Here we go. When I see a patient's leg and it looks just like that little section there and, and or this sheets here, I can actually tell that their skin had been stretched out at one point. And when I see it all wrinkled, it lets me know their edema is actually going down because it's not tight and shiny anymore. It happens all the time. I, I can go into a room and I'm looking at the patient's leg and I'll say, oh, wow, your swelling's gone down. Even though that's the first time I have seen this patient in my life, they'll say, oh, how do you know? And it's because I can tell their skin is like shrinking back. It's like grape skin. Okay. Uh, the next diuretic I would like to discuss is, boop. Yep. A potassium sparing diuretic known as spironolactone spironolactone. It actually spares the potassium, meaning while it is letting out all of the fluids, the potassium is actually going to hang back and it's going to stay in the body. It is oftentimes given with a thiazide diuretic, such as hydrochlorothiazide, or even a loop diuretic, such as furosemide, um, especially if someone needs more help with flu fluid overload management. It's great because it balances the potassium out perfectly, meaning the other two waste the potassium, this one spares it. So now your potassium's like just hanging out, being all normal. All right, hear ye, hear ye. We cannot give spironolactone with ACE inhibitors, anything with a prill on it, ACE inhibitors. You're about to discuss um, that ACE inhibitors have the side effect of hyperkalemia. So that would actually be less than ideal to give a potassium sparing drug with another drug that can elevate potassium. <laughs> uh, hello waiter, who ordered this hyperkalemia with a side of dysrhythmia for me? Because it was actually not me. That's right, can you take that back to the chef? Thank you. Okay, few more drugs we need to discuss. 
as soon as I get rid of that. Good. I'm happy now. Click. Nitrates. This would be nitroglycerin. It has a lovely side effect of hypotension. So please do make sure your person's blood pressure is greater than 100 before administering this. Um, a lovely side effect of nitroglycerin is headaches. Ooh, yes, headaches. I feel so bad for my patients. It is not meaning a contraindication or anything, but you give this medicine, it's made to vasodilate veins. There's veins in your head. Those are going to dilate too, causing headaches. Mm -hmm. It does get better with time, meaning their headaches do tend to uh, go down the longer they use the medication. But yeah, it's unfortunate. Sorry, here's some Tylenol. <laughs> um, do make sure if a person has a nitroglycerin patch, which is really good. It's usually, you know, low dose. Um, and helps to vasodilate the vessels if they have that patch on you need to put it on an area where the skin is intact meaning it's not broken they don't have like a skin tear or something because it would absorb way too quickly then and make sure to rotate sites um, also there needs to be a, a nitrate free period in a 24-hour day so you're going to apply the patch or paste for 20 uh, for 12 hours and then you need to take it off for 12 hours so on 12 off 12 on 12 off 12 the reason for this is because a patient whose life really depends on this drug can actually develop a drug tolerance really quickly and unfortunately we would have to go up on a dose for a person so 12 on 12 off if you have a patch or paste to decrease drug tolerance to nitro okay Beta blockers. Ooh, doo -doo -doo. Let's do this. Let's do a low dose beta blocker and start very slowly. It is good for those who have chronic heart failure, not those who have acute heart failure. It is good for those with chronic heart failure, not an acute exacerbation where they can't breathe. Right. There we go. Beta blockers. Get it? Block. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see some side effects. Side effects of beta blockers are bradycardia and hypotension. So this means we are going to make sure our heart rate is greater than 50, 50 before administering a beta blocker to our patient. And we're going to make sure their blood pressure is greater than 100. Some doctors will actually increase the threshold and say make sure the heart rate is greater than 110. Nope. Uh, sorry, make sure the blood pressure is greater than 110 for our older adults because they don't tolerate low blood pressures very well. We are going to evaluate them uh, usually weekly in the outpatient setting for changes, make sure their activity and tolerance is improving because they should be benefiting from this drug. Um, and I'm going to tell you something crazy about beta blockers. Mm -hmm. Something crazy here. We have to be very cautious of their use in diabetics. Why? Well, because their hypoglycemic symptoms are actually going to be masked. Masked. I'm not saying that word right. M-A-S-K-E-D. Masked. And um, we can actually have a beta blocker, beta blocker exacerbate signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia. So we're going to mask the signs. We're going to exacerbate hypoglycemia. Yeah, that sounds bad, right? Well, the hypoglycemic symptoms masked by this class of medications include the tremor, palpitations, the hunger that a patient may feel, the tremors, uh, I already mentioned that, irritability, and even confusion. They're all going to be concealed. So how do you know if a person who's diabetic and taking a beta blocker actually has their sugar dropping? Well, one, you check the sugar, but the, uh, two, you assess for sweating because they probably will have diaphoresis. They won't have the tachycardia or nothing, but they will have diaphoresis. That might be your only recognizable sign and symptom of hypoglycemia in those treated with beta blockers. Okay. Um, and the other reason that a beta blocker can actually exacerbate hypoglycemia is for the fact that it actually inhibits the hepatic glucose from being produced, which is a, uh, you know, a counter regulation mechanism that the body does. 
So it's actually going to inhibit hepatic glucose production. So what I'm trying to say here is if you have a diabetic who's on a bacon blocker, just look for sweating, test their numbers, um, and you don't need to rely on the other signs and symptoms and know that they're going to go down faster in their blood sugar than other patients. Whew. Okay, beta blockers. One more thing, one more thing. The third point that I need to make that we have to be cautious about when we use this in medications, use these medications is in our COPD and asthma patients. All right, take a good look at this. Follow along closely. There are two types of beta blockers. There are selective beta blockers, such as uh, these. Do, 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 do. Selective beta blockers, and then they are non-selective beta blockers. Non-selective beta blockers mean they actually stimulate receptors on both the heart and lungs. Where here, these guys, they'll actually only stimulate the heart, which is what we want it to do. So here's what I want you to pay attention to. If we have a COPD patient and for some reason they are having a fast heart rate and because they have heart failure, um, be sure that the doctor knows about their COPD so they can order a cardio selective beta blocker or a beta one blocker. Um, because the beta blocker can actually block the effect of our drug, like albuterol, which we want to give to somebody as COPD, you know, because we know albuterol will activate the beta receptors on the striae and the lungs to dilate. And if we block those receptors, we block the dilation. If we block the dilation, we block the airways. So if you had to choose to give your COPD patient uh, that has heart failure, would you choose propanolol? or would you choose metoprolol? Doctor calls and says, I want this person to be on propanolol or metoprolol. You pick, which one are you gonna grab? Hint, hint, the answer is in the cardio selective one or the beta one blocker column, because remember, you only want to block those receptors, not the ones on your lungs. Okay, got your answer? I hope you chose metoprolol. Good, okay, let's keep moving. Next, next, there we go. Next thing we're going to do is give our person digoxin. Do, 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 do. I don't know why we needed a trumpet there. I'm sorry. Digoxin. Digoxin is great. It's a cardiac glycoside and it's very useful in our patients who have heart failure because it increases contractility and it reduces the heart rate. It increases contractility and it reduces the heart rate. Um, make sure not to give it with any antacid drugs because it's going to interfere with the absorption of digoxin. And there is such a thing as dig toxicity, dig toxicity. Um, this occurs if you have way too much digoxin, meaning you um, take too many tablets, you can have dig toxicity or you can have dig toxicity if somebody's potassium goes too low, maybe because of a diuretic like furosemide or something, you can develop ditch toxicity then. This ditch is not going to be good. In fact, what are we going to have as our signs or symptom if somebody um, has ditch toxicity? You are going to say they're going to have anorexia. They're going to have nausea vomiting. They're going to have green and yellow halos and some confusion. Right, those are signs and symptoms of ditch toxicity, either from too much of a pill uh, or a low potassium. What are you gonna give them if they have that? Well, to give them, you're gonna give them a digibind. Digibind, that is the antidote for ditch toxicity. All right, arteries, relax, relax. We need to give our arteries something to relax because they are way too resistant against that poor little weak heart muscle. Heart can't pump against it. So we got to relax the arteries. Namaste. Okay, so we're going to give them some ACE inhibitors or maybe an ARB, an angiotensin receptor blocker. Some things we need to know is that when we give a person an ACE inhibitor, we might have a nagging cough. 
we might have a nagging cough. And if that's the case, they actually have to discontinue the medication. Sometimes a patient can get on an ARB and they won't have the cough at all, but do assess for a nagging dry cough with an ACE inhibitor. Um, ACE inhibitors are not as effective in our African-American population. Um, they don't respond as well to it. So you will oftentimes see African-Americans with heart failure placed on a calcium channel blocker such as amlodipine or Norvasc. I mean, they can try it, but don't expect a good uh, change or result. Now, um, a downside to our ACE inhibitors and our ARBs, which you kind of already know, is that it tends to increase our potassium tends to increase our potassium. So do make sure that if a person is on ACE inhibitor that they don't get ordered a potassium sparing diuretic because we're going to have way too high of potassium. Now I have a picture of a girl with a sodium, um, I can't think of the word, molecular image. <laughs> yeah, I, you're probably yelling at it, yelling at the screen trying to tell me what I'm trying to say. I can't. Anatomical Note, no, we won't go there. All right, your sodium can actually go down with ACE inhibitors, your ACE inhibitors and ARBs as well. And what goes with sodium? Water. Uh, so I know we want our person with heart failure not to have too much water, but yes, they can actually get on the too dry of side. So monitor their ins and outs make sure they're uh, still urinating, make sure it's not super concentrated and dark looking, maybe check out their uh, creatinine levels, make sure their kidneys are happy and functioning well and it's not greater than like, you know, 1.1 or 1.2. Let's make sure to assess for orthostatic hypotension, which is huge in our older adults. In fact, oftentimes we will give them this medication in the hospital and monitor them for that orthostatic hypotension. Um, let's see, usually whenever I am giving somebody an ACE inhibitor, I double check their renal function. I double check their renal function to make sure that it's not too high because these drugs are excellent in helping a heart that has failed because it can actually remodel their heart. However, um, it can cause some real damage if they are in kidney failure in any shape or form. So if their kidneys are not working as evidenced by a high creatinine, then we should call the doctor and ask them to take them off this drug. Last thing I want to show you is angioedema. Nice, huh? This is a pretty nasty side effect, or I should say adverse reaction of taking an ACE inhibitor or an ARB. So if they have one, they cannot have the other. Angioedema is swelling of the upper airway and of the face. This is a female who took an ACE inhibitor and over a matter of, I think, two hours, maybe, she developed massive angioedema. I forgot to mention, if somebody does develop angioedema, immediately administer to them Benadryl IV give them solumedrol or some kind of steroid, maybe decadron, dexamethasone is the other name for that, and you might have to give them epinephrine to try to counteract um, that massive anaphylactic type reaction that they are having. Yeah, not good. And don't ever give them an ACE or an ARB again. Nope. <laughs> okay, now to this slide. This slide is all about um, decreasing their fatigue or their weakness. So what is an acceptable level of exertion for a patient? Well, it's a good question. Uh, on top of them telling you, you can actually double check their heart rate and their blood pressure. And if a person has more than a 20 beat rise in their resting heart rate, or if they have a 20, 20 millimeter of mercury rise in their blood pressure, then that lets us know it's actually too much stress physically on our person to move. So we'll have to maybe walk only half of the hallway or only get out of bed three times a day instead of like five, whatever goals we set. 
So um, decrease their emotional fatigue as well, meaning don't rush the client. Try to include the family members to help participate in their care. Um, do update the client on progress and upcoming interventions. One good thing to do is to write um, on the board anytime that like, okay, we're waiting on labs to be drawn or you have a chest x right today, whatever it may be, write it on the board. Um, try to see if your person can at least sit up to eat or maybe dangle their feet on the side of the bed to eat. You do want to organize your nursing care to allow for periods of rest. Clustering is a good and bad thing. Um, just pay real close attention to see if clustering your care, meaning you come in, your PT come in, your P physical therapist, you know, comes in, or maybe even your CNA. Let your patient tell you if that's too much or if that's okay. Check your vitals often, because once again, we're looking for that rise in blood pressure and heart rate of 20 digits or more. Do try to see if your person can um, measure their fatigue on a scale, just like, you know, the scale that we use for pain and the scale that we use for dyspnea. That will help, uh, you know, you communicate better with your patient and them communicate with you, really. Uh, oh, one little tidbit. Increase their activity in little bits at a time until they are tolerating 200 feet per activity session. Like they're actually ambulating 200 feet. Well, how long is 200 feet? Because I am not good at estimating this. But I do know I can count tiles, ceiling tiles. Each ceiling tile is approximately two feet wide by two. It's actually square, so two by two. So you would go ahead and make sure a person can walk 100 tiles distance on the ceiling. Um, yep, to see if they are actually increasing their activity tolerance, because that would be a good goal to set for them. Uh, right, and our last nursing intervention is the potential for pulmonary edema and to reduce it. This would actually be an NQ, uh, endotracheal tube. This is somebody's chin here. Yep, yep, yep. And there's their chin and this is their chest. Okay, so you are going to assess for early signs of pulmonary edema, such as the crackles in the bases, and you're going to document these locations. So from one shift to the next, they have a good understanding of the what and the where. Our um, other assessment needs to be, do they have dyspnea at rest? Is there disorientation? Or is there confusion? Do put your person in a high Fowler's position if you notice these things and apply oxygen therapy if their SATs are less than 90. Um, make sure to give your person nitroglycerin. This is going to decrease the afterload and preload on the heart. You're going to give them rapid acting diuretics, the fast ones. They're going to work super fast for you. The ones that I am thinking of are ferrosamide and bumetamide, also known as Lasix or Bumex. These are loop diuretics. Administer morphine to your patient. I know, I know what you're thinking. How and why am I giving my person morphine? Because that is going to suppress their respirations and I have a respiratory issue and I get it. However, morphine has a plus benefit of actually opening up and decreasing somebody's air hunger. Uh, let me say the opening up. They open up the vessels that surround the heart a little bit. So you kind of have a good thing going for you if you give somebody morphing during a time of heart failure and respiratory distress. So give them a smidge of morphine. I'm not talking like 10 milligrams, y'all. I'm talking like one to two milligrams. Jeez. All right, you're going to uh, continue your assessment, your, your rate, your rhythm, your blood pressure, usually every 30 minutes to an hour. This is a very dangerous and scary thing when they start developing frothy sputum. So administer your oxygen, administer your ferrosamide, and if they don't start peeing, you may actually have to send them for emergent dialysis and probably intubate them in the elevator kind of thing. And it scare you. Uh, are you going to give your person a thiazide drug like hydrochlorothiazide during this situation? Nope. Because 
you have noticed that they have pulmonary edema and you know that hydrochlorothiazide takes forever to work in your percent. So uh, this is not a good drug of choice. Make sure they get the loop diuretic. I feel like I've said enough about that. Some other non-surgical options for our person, we can put them on CPAP or BiPAP. That's what you see here and what we noticed earlier in our improving oxygenation slide. We can actually do cardiac resynchronization therapy for all of their arrhythmias that they may be having. So we may um, insert a pacemaker, maybe if they have the bad kind of arrhythmias such as V-fib or V-tac, we may have to do an AICD, which we'll talk about later. <clears throat> um, how about gene therapy? Interesting, huh? We can actually inject your heart um, with genes that will assist and remodel, like little embryonic cells. This is um, something we would do for a end-stage heart failure patient, and they are not candidates for a heart transplant. Another um, thing I need to mention about CPAP is patients who have sleep apnea, they should most definitely sleep with CPAP because there's a huge connection of heart failure in patients with sleep apnea. So if they have sleep apnea and they wear their CPAP, it actually is going to assist them and slow down their heart failure tremendously. And another thing I want to mention about the cardiac resynchronization therapy, it is used for patients who have less than 35% uh, on their EF. Remember that echocardiogram? We talked about EF being 50 to 70, and it's bad if you're less than 40%. Well, if you're less than 35%, you actually qualify for the resynchronization therapy. Okay, surgical management. So we're not gonna talk long about this, but um, in LVAD is what you see there, a left ventricular assist device, is actually a intermediate intervention till we can get a person a heart transplant. It's an intermediate intervention till we can get them to a heart transplant. Now, are people who have end-stage renal disease, maybe severe lung disease, or maybe even a clotting disorder, uh, or frequent infections, they actually are not candidates for LVADs, unfortunately. And these patients do not have a pulse. Reason being is a pulse is generated from the left ventricle squeezing. And we are actually going to bypass all of that and just send the blood straight through this little generator straight to the body. So interesting. I know, right? Um, another thing I have here is a myosplint. Somebody who has heart failure has a enlarged flabby heart. So this myosplint is actually used to try to support the walls of the heart. So it's going to beat a little bit better. But I'm not going to talk much about this. Mm, yeah. And no, you don't need to know what each of these are on the test. Do not need to know that. Okay, cardiac rehab. I am telling you guys, if you want a cush job, don't work holidays, you know, good schedule for, you know, a family life, become a cardiac rehab nurse. It is nice. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to send our patients to a cardiac pulmonary rehab and a person is going to go and actually work out under supervision. Uh, yep, a physical therapist will be there and a nurse usually. And patients will have a very specific regimen that they need to follow so many days per week on this machine and that machine. And it is just all supervised by a medical team until they can get their heart back up to being stronger and they won't need cardiac rehab anymore. If you are in here, make sure to ask your patient frequently, are you developing chest pain or is your dyspnea severe, moderate, minimal? Um, because if that's the case, you have exerted the person too much and you need to back the activity back down. Now, unfortunately, cardiac rehab is not often paid by insurance, so it is an out-of-pocket expense. But 
uh, this is where I would encourage you to advocate to insurance companies to include cardiac rehab because it is shown and proven uh, actually in our data to be extremely helpful for our patient who goes. Okay, here are some things I need you to remember before we end our session. Core measures, right. Because our patients with heart failure come in the hospital two, three times a year with heart failure exacerbations, Medicare and Medicaid have now set a standard to hospitals, meaning they have said, if you don't document this teaching and reduce the number of times that these patients come into the hospital, we will not reimburse you. A hospital that is not reimbursed affects you because that is a, your paycheck. So we have been told basically by Medicare and Medicaid to document and do not only document, but do these things and they're good. We should do them anyway. So they refer to them as core measures. So one of the big core measures is diet. So we need to be teaching diet and charting that we taught them about their diet. What was it about their diet again? They have low salt, maybe two to three grams. They have low fluid, such as two liters. Uh, oh, and they need to limit their alcohol consumption. So teach them about diet. We need to teach and chart them, uh, chart them, and chart about activity. Their ADLs, they don't need to overdo it. They need to be able to talk while, say, they're, they're moving, talk while exercising. Encourage them to walk 200 to 400 feet per day. And to stop, actually, if chest pain or severe dyspnea uh, results. Or maybe if they have extreme fatigue the next day, it was too much, and they need to build up to that. The next one, medications. I know I talked a lot about medications, but I have to... They don't need to, uh, let's see, tell patients not to run out of their medications, take them as prescribed. They need to know the purpose of them and the side effects of them, such as take your blood pressure before administering um, a beta blocker, or it may mask the signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia, blah, blah, blah. Um, they need to also remember to avoid certain medications. Do you remember that one medication I mentioned avoiding? Mm-hmm. Was it NSAIDs? Right, they need to avoid insets because that promotes fluid and sodium retention. All right, a person needs to know how to weigh themselves every single day. I'm talking in your birthday suit, step on that scale. And if you're not from America, in your or from the South, I guess, weighing yourself in your birthday suit means naked. Get on the scale naked. And how much is considered too much weight gain? So what we are gonna ask our patients to do is report if they gain three pounds in one week, or if they gain maybe one to two pounds overnight. That is considered too much fluid and they need to call us. And remember, one liter of fluid equals one kilogram or 2.2 pounds. And last but not least, they need to have a plan for symptoms. They need to have a plan for symptoms. Much like our asthma patient has a plan, uh, an asthma action plan, our heart failure patient needs a plan for their symptoms. So if I experience shortness of breath when I walk 200 feet, I need to do X. All right. <clears throat> our person with heart failure probably needs to have an echocardiogram, which is going to evaluate the left ventricle function yearly. And if they're stable, maybe a little bit more, uh, uh, more frequently, less frequently than that, like over two years or something, but we need to have charted an evaluation of their uh, left ventricular function as evidenced by an echo report. Looking at that EF, they need to be, unless it's contraindicated, um, on an ACE or an ARB, such as uh, the African-American community, we have tried to put them on the ACE. It showed ineffective, which it's oftentimes ineffective for them. So that's why they're not on that being discharged on that medication. Or they had angioedema. I don't know. All right. Smoking cessation. We need to document if they are smoking that we have attempted to get them help to quit. Last but not least, uh, we are going to um, check the box about assigning them a home health care nurse. They are probably going to give some direct care after discharge, and their focus is to evaluate and to teach, evaluate and to teach. 
Um, and it'll give the patient the opportunity to verbalize some feelings and concerns. Maybe they can assess their coping strategies, um, self-control. All right, uh, last but not least, home care management. Um, if the person has issues, the American Heart Association is rich in education material and support groups for patients and caregivers, so please refer them there. All right, that is the end of the PowerPoint now, so go and make yourself productive and, I don't know, study something else. But I can't stop watching, I know. I can't stop watching it either. Okay, I can stop. <laughs>